Hello and welcome to the National D-Day Memorial for our virtual lunchbox lecture today. My name is John Long, the Director of Education here at the Memorial, and we're looking forward to a fantastic talk uh, with Jared Frederick, whom I'll introduce in just a moment. But before we get to Jared, let me tease some of our other upcoming virtual events. Uh, two weeks from today, on February 3rd, our president, April Cheek Messier, will give a program titled The Heroines of the 6888. The 6888 Postal Battalion was the only all-female, all-African-American unit posted to Europe during World War II. It has a fascinating history uh, and played a very important role that you don't often think about, how important it was for the men in uniform to get their mail from home and get be able to write home to their loved ones. Uh, the 6 Triple Eight made that possible largely, and uh, April will tell their story coming up on the 3rd. Then two weeks after that, on February 17th, we will have an interview with a representative from the Congressional Medal of Honor Society, who will tell us about some of the Medal of Honor recipients from the Normandy campaign, D-Day, as well as afterwards. Uh, and that's going to be a very interesting one that I think uh, people will, will greatly enjoy and learn a lot. And then uh, on March 3rd, we will welcome in author Linda Hervieu, author of the book Forgotten, the story of the 320th Barrage Balloon Battalion, the only African-American unit to land on D-Day. Uh, if you know the, uh, the, all the photos from World War II, and you see these kind of blimp things flying over battlefields or over ships or over cities. Those are barrage balloons. And on D-Day, it was largely this African-American unit that put up those anti-aircraft defenses uh, that were so important. So that's another fascinating story. And Linda will be with us from France uh, on March 3rd to tell us that story as well. And then check our webpage frequently for other upcoming events, upcoming uh, lectures, through the spring and into summer. But today, it is my privilege to welcome Jared Franklin as our speaker. Jared is the author of a number of books, including the one that's his main focus today, Dispatches of D-Day, A People's History of the Normandy Invasion, looking at a lot of the press coverage from across the nation uh, on D-Day. And Jared, I read this over Christmas break and thoroughly enjoyed it. So looking forward to the presentation. But in addition, he's written several other books, including a, a biography of uh, Dick Winters that here is here beside me, Hang Tough. Uh, and um, Jared is an instructor in history at Penn State Altoona, previously served as a park ranger at Gettysburg National Military Park and Harper's Ferry. So uh, if you want to talk to Jared about the Civil War, he can, he can uh, cover that as well. He's been on featured on C-SPAN, on PBS, number of documentaries. Uh, he's introduced World War II movies, Returner classic movies as a guest host, and, and uh, as well as many other uh, ways that he has helped to get the word out about World War II and the greatest generation. Uh, so, uh, Jared, uh, we're going to bring you up now, and we uh, greatly appreciate it. But uh, hopefully everything is going to work for the moment. So welcome. And I'm going to turn it over to you. Hello, and thank you for that introduction. Uh, I'll go ahead and share my screen here so we can uh, bring up my PowerPoint presentation. Just bear with me here for a moment. All right. Uh, so one of the prevailing questions that I had when I started to research this book was, what was exactly the American experience on D-Day? And while we've looked a lot at the stories of Omaha Beach and Utah Beach, the exploits of the Airborne, I also wanted to get some perspective on what was it like on the home front? on D-Day. That was an often ne neglected and overlooked aspect of the Normandy invasion. Uh, and so that, that seemingly simple question uh, blossomed into this massive research project in which I dug deep into the newspaper archives. Uh, and so what, what began as this rather 
simple inquiry, or so I originally thought, uh, turned into this massive project where I ended up transcribing over 300,000 words uh, from newspaper reports chronicling the Normandy invasion. And so the, the genesis of this book came about through that research. And from that research, I pulled what I thought were the best and most revealing of firsthand accounts from the Normandy invasion. This book is not the story of generals. It is not the story of command decisions, but rather it is the story of common people who have often been neglected from the history books. And that, by and large, is what Dispatches of D-Day is all about. So our story begins uh, not on the battlefields of France, but in the rather unlikely place of Austin, Texas. And on that Tuesday morning, June 6, 1944, students from the University of Texas were preparing for their final exams. And there was a strong thunderstorm that was coming over the Texas of Capital, uh, the, the capital of Texas at that time. And uh, over the, the crackling wavelengths of the radio, there was this sudden news of the invasion had finally arrived. And one of the student reporters for the student newspaper, who we see here, a young man by the name of Horace Busby, uh, captured the, the attitude and the emotion of that fraught hour. And he said, roommates were rolled out of bed, lights snapped on as fast as word could be screamed down hallways, telephones began to ring, and a rain-drenched Austin came to life. And that sentiment could be expressed of almost any American town in the United States on Tuesday, June 6th, 1944. And as Americans arose from bed, they often found newspapers much like this on their front porches and on their front sidewalks, big, bold lettering in red and black, announcing what had been long awaited and long anticipated. And one of my primary arguments in the book is that D-Day was the biggest news story of all time. It was bigger than the Kennedy assassination. It was bigger than the Apollo 11 moon landing. And the reason why that was so is because every single county in the United States had a personal connection to the Normandy invasion. Everybody knew somebody who was there, who was involved. And therefore, the, the emotional consequences, the emotional connection that was associated with the Normandy invasion, it was felt on a universal basis in almost every community of the United States. And I think that is one of the aspects that makes D-Day and the story of the Normandy invasion such a profound and emotional thing. But before we get to the invasion itself, we're going to back uh, log a little bit and we're going to get some understanding of the preparation, the, the uh, emotion, the sentiments that were widespread leading up to all of this. And one of the other very vital elements of my book is the significance of a free press in wartime, uh, the, the importance of the, the First Amendment, uh, as all of these limitations were being placed on information uh, during the war years. And uh, certainly, you know, the American public wasn't told everything, uh, and nor could reporters report everything that they learned. But there was this expectation that the press would be truthful to the American people. And certainly, this was an expectation that was likewise expressed in Stars and Stripes, U.S. Army newspaper that was uh, widely read in all theaters of operation. And Throughout the war, Stars and Stripes made these very emotional pleas to service members who read its papers. And uh, this is something that was said in the spring of 1944 that I think really gets the, to the heart of the democracy that American service members were fighting for. And the newspaper said the quest to self-educate will in itself make you a better informed soldier, a better educated American. And in the days ahead, when it becomes your job to help decide issues on which the future all depends, your knowledge of the big picture will make you a better citizen. And in a small way, 
that will help make this a better world. And so uh, the, the right to information, a celebration of literacy, um, holding up the free press as, a, as an ideal of American democracy was something that was very much on the minds of service members as that clock ticked ever closer to June 6, 1944. All that said, there were certainly limitations on notions of American liberty, and the best representation of this is the fact that the United States military was segregated, and it would remain segregated for another four years following D-Day. Um, and so African-American soldiers who were spending this preparation time in England uh, often came to these rather harsh realizations and one of those realizations is that they were treated better in a foreign country than what they were back in their home states and home communities. Great Britain was devoid of Jim Crow, segregation, and color lines. And uh, the, the sad truth of the matter is that many Black veterans felt more at home 3,000 miles away from home. And uh, one African-American sergeant uh, said this most pointedly, and he said, we black troops went overseas to fight the Germans, but we had to fight the Yanks first. And so a very harsh reality indeed. Uh, but one of the things that I did not expect to find in my research was the fact that D-Day became a stepping stone for the civil rights movement in the United States. And American newspapers were something that helped to propel this movement forward. This was especially so for the Pittsburgh Courier, which initiated the Double V campaign during World War II, which symbolized victory overseas would mean victory at home in regard to civil rights. Uh, the Pittsburgh Courier is one of the widest read African-American newspapers in the United States. And it promoted this agenda that if African-American troops serve honorably overseas, they will have earned the full rights of citizenship that they and some of their ancestors had long been denied. And so uh, this was a very unexpected element of my research that I found um, because there were all sorts of conversations within civil rights circles about what D-Day meant and how civil rights advocates could use it from an ideological standpoint moving forward. And so this was some really, really fascinating stuff that I initially wasn't anticipating on finding. Um, overcoming other hurdles as well, of course, uh, were women associated with military service. This was particularly so for female correspondents who were uh, covering the various military campaigns overseas. And they found themselves um, in these, these two domains that were completely male-dominated for the most part. Uh, and that was military hierarchy and also the press and media. Uh, and many of them made devout commitments that, you know, come hell or high water, they were going to be covering the Normandy invasion. Uh, we see some of those uh, female correspondents um, here in the background preparing for the invasion. And perhaps most insistent uh, among these reporters uh, is a woman who we see in the lower right-hand corner of the screen. And that was one by the name of Martha Gellhorn, who worked for Collier's Weekly. And she said, it is necessary that I report on this war. It is necessary that I see for those who cannot see for themselves. And she insisted on this despite the, the limitations uh, presumably placed on her by her own husband, who also worked for Collier's Weekly, the even better known Ernest Hemingway, who we see here in the upper right-hand corner. Uh, and so uh, this is where uh, uh, a couple, uh, spouses, uh, became competitors. Uh, who was going to get the first scoop on the Normandy invasion? And we will be circling back to Martha Gellhorn in a little bit to see exactly uh, what her fate and circumstances were and her competition with her correspondent husband. As all of this talk was ongoing, though, about when is D-Day going to happen? You know, that was the big question. You know, American newspapers were taking polls. You know, they were having raffles. You know, they were doing pick the date, uh, you know, and, and having all of these guessing games. But if you were to ask a member of the U.S. Army 8th Air Force in the spring of 1944, when will D-Day begin? they would have given you the answer that it already had begun. 
uh, because the the Eighth Air Force, as well as other air forces, uh, had been uh, trying to dominate the skies of Nazi-occupied Europe for the last two years. Um, and General Hap Arnold, who was the commander of the Eighth Air Force, was very insistent on this point as well to uh, international reporters when he said in the spring of 1944, we are invading and not at some remote beachhead. We are hitting the enemy where he lives. He knows if he cannot stop us, he's licked. Uh, and so behind this mentality was the thought of, uh, frankly, uh, quantity over quality, that we are going to win this thing by sheer number. And certainly other reporters were going to be reflecting that thought as we move along as well. Uh, but in speaking of preparation, uh, this is one of my favorite photos of this mobilization for D-Day. And this is a port in Devon, England uh, at D-5, five days before D-Day. And as one reporter described it, uh, he, he he described this, this huge process of uh, ships and, and vehicles and uh, supply depots filled to the brim. He described it as a mechanical Niagara. And that is to say he, he encouraged visitors to, to envision Niagara Falls, but instead of water, uh, picture, uh, you know, crates and, you know, ships and vehicles and bulldozers and everything else imaginable going into this colossal effort to prepare for these hundreds of thousands of Allied troops that would soon be crossing the English Channel and be using the shores of Normandy as a stepping stone toward conquering uh, the foothold of Nazi Germany. Um, and so a very, very compelling photograph that we see right here. And the, the great challenge of organizing all of this uh, was placed upon a man who had never served in combat. And that was Dwight D. Eisenhower, the supreme commander of the Allied Expeditionary Force. And Eisenhower's great strength, a uh, strength that he would later use as president of the United States, is that he was a very good negotiator. He was a very good diplomat. He excelled at finding middle-of-the-road solutions and bringing people of adverse opinions and ideas together to bring about the best possible solutions. Uh, and doing so was certainly not an easy task for this general, uh, you know, and it, it, it created a lot of stress for him. Uh, he, he smoked perhaps four packs of cigarettes a day. This would later contribute to his heart attack when he was president of the United States. Uh, but a, a lot of people considered this to be a glorious burden of sorts. And reporter Ann O'Hare McCormick of the New York Times, I think, said it best when she said, never has the fate of so many depended on the judgment of so few. And another reporter said that it seemed like each one of the four stars that was on Eisenhower's shoulder seemed like they weighed a ton. Such was, indeed, this glorious burden. And we get a sense of Eisenhower's uh, psychological standing the day before the invasion when he issues this now very famous document. He doesn't issue it, but he composes it, um, in which he accepts full responsibility for the failure of Operation Overlord, the code name for this invasion. And this speaks of his leadership ethics. Uh, it's, it suggests that he was willing not only to take credit for successes, but he would also be willing to accept the responsibilities for the possibilities of, of defeat. Um, but the very interesting uh, kind of subliminal thing about this is that if we look at the bottom of this letter, we can see that he puts the wrong date. Instead of June 5th, he puts July 5th. And uh, I think we can you know, subliminally read into that as uh, it being a snapshot into his mental state as he is ready to pull the trigger on Operation Overlord. Uh, as I said, my book is, it's not really about strategy, you know, it's not about command decisions. Um, and therefore, I, I only have one map in, in my entire book. Uh, that, that's really all that I need. Uh, but, you know, for the purposes of, of explanation here for our viewers, uh, just to offer a little bit of a sense of geography, uh, is that 
uh, troops from a dozen different nationalities, but primarily United States, uh, British, Canadian, and Free French, uh, will be landing on a number of beachheads over a stretch of shore that goes about 60 miles. And over the, the course of that terrain uh, on D-Day, um, you will have well over 150,000 troops pouring ashore, uh, certainly suggesting that this is the, the largest amphibious operation in human history. Uh, so many elements of all of this are dependent upon time, logistics, action, followed by reaction. Uh, and so this seesaw process of how the campaign was going to be fought is a fundamental element of understanding how it unfolds in the days to come. Uh, but the, the, the monumental scale of it is still something that awes historians to this very day, myself included. So the first elements of this, uh, as we famously see in a miniseries such as Band of Brothers, uh, is the dropping of airborne troops and the landing of glider-borne troops in the earliest minutes and hours of June 6, 1944. There will be perhaps about uh, 13,000 of these airborne troops who will be landing behind enemy lines, whose responsibility is to wreak havoc, cut communications, stir confusion amongst the German ranks, and help pave the way for the amphibious troops who will be landing on the nearby beach as just five or six hours hence. Uh, for any of you watching, I don't know if you've ever gone skydiving before, um, but it can be a fairly terrifying proposition. And uh, this, was, this was doubled or, or tripled so uh, for these airborne troops because they have over 100 pounds of gear on them. They are jumping into pitch black darkness. And of course, people are shooting at them. And then when they land, there's the possibility that they might land in these flooded pastures and boggy meadows that the Germans purposely flooded. So it was a very, very dangerous proposition indeed. And Dwight Eisenhower was told by one of his chief air marshals that perhaps 80% of these paratroopers could have been killed in combat. But thankfully, in the long run, the casualty count was substantially less than that. There are so many firsthand stories from these airborne troops that are among uh, my favorite that I discovered in the course of researching this book um, is the story of this platoon that was nicknamed the Filthy 13. And they were part of the 101st Airborne Division. And they had this very uh, gritty, macho esprit de corps where they, you know, shaved their heads mohawk style. They put on war paint. They hadn't bathed since December of 1943 because they wanted to live it rough in preparation for the Normandy invasion. And they quite literally had this sometimes take no prisoners mentality. And so there was that certain grit and tenacity that was associated with a lot of these airborne troops. And I think Stars and Stripes put it best when it described them as well, pity the poor Nazi who encounters them. Uh, and indeed, they lived up to that reputation. As an interesting uh, cultural anecdote, um, just about uh, two decades later, uh, the Filthy 13 became the inspiration for the 1967 action film, The Dirty Dozen. And so a, a very interesting, if not fictionalized, legacy they have in that regard. Uh, meanwhile, as the paratroopers are up to their deeds behind enemy lines. There are over 5,000 ships that have converged on the English Channel. They are circling offshore. Many of them are landing craft. Many of them are more uh, substantial destroyers, cruisers, battleships. Uh, every sort of ship of every conceivable size was in, in the English Channel on that day. And I think Naval Captain Herschel West uh, describe this uh, massive uh, assemblage of ships uh, the best. And he said one could use all of the adjectives such as colossal, magnificent, stupendous, marvelous, greatest, immense, and still not give any idea of the number of men and material being moved. And it's interesting to point out um, that, believe it or not, the majority of these ships were British ships. Um, a lot of people just assume that the United States had naval dominance on D-Day, uh, but that was not the case. And th th this was really the, 
the truest sense of international collaboration, uh, what we see here. Everyone has to be synchronized and on the same page as things move forward. Uh, as troops are being shuffled to shore in these various landing craft, this, this led me to discovering uh, one of my favorite stories in the book, and it involves a sailor from Wyoming by the name of Lawrence Patman, who was taking troops to shore, and he noticed that these GIs uh, had a dog with them, uh, a mascot named Muffin. And shortly thereafter, uh, the landing craft suffered a direct hit, and everybody went flying into the water. Many people on board were killed, and Patman himself was horribly injured. Um, his hand was swollen to the size of a football as a result of, of this blast. Um, and uh, he was fearful that he was going to drown because he could not easily swim. Uh, and lo and behold, uh, salvation ultimately came with the sounding of a bark. Uh, Muffin the dog had survived the blast, was in the water. He called out to the dog and it came paddling over. And uh, it, it swam right up against him, and he put his good arm over the dog and was able to use Muffin as an improvised uh, flotation device. Uh, and so the dog ultimately saved him and kept him afloat. And uh, both the owner and, and the dog, the master and the dog, uh, were later picked up by a British rescue vessel. Uh, Patman, he lost his hand. It, it was amputated as a result of his injury. Uh, but as he later said, that that mutt saved my life. Uh, and so there's just some of these stories that you can't make up. Uh, and indeed, sometimes a truth is stranger than fiction. Uh, among the first amphibious troops to uh, land on the shores of Normandy were the troops of the United States 4th Infantry Division who landed on Utah Beach. And among them was my own grandfather, Thomas Nickham of the 20th Field Artillery Battalion in that division. And uh, despite the fact that uh, the, the men of the 4th, uh, also known as the Ivy Division, uh, suffered far fewer casualties on Utah Beach, uh, they would really mount up their casualties in the days to come as the fighting pushed inland. And uh, this was a division that would suffer something like 250% casualties throughout the war. I mean, so they may have been comparatively spared on D-Day, but it certainly caught up with them later on. And the men of the 4th uh, expressed their displeasure to the American press that they weren't getting the headlines that they thought they deserved. Um, and the Stars and Stripes later had this to say about that. It said, the boys of the Ivy Division heard that a lot of people were getting credit for the Allied advances in France. That is almost everybody but the 4th. And this was revealing to me because it showed that there was an expectation among soldiers in the ranks that if they acted heroically and accomplished their missions, they wanted recognition for it in the newspapers. So their fellow soldiers could know, and so people back home could know as well. And so that once again circles us back to the importance of the press in wartime. Another reason as to why Utah Beach is often overlooked is because of the far greater bloodshed that unfolds on Omaha Beach, where some of the Bedford boys uh, will lose their lives as well. And uh, a fellow veteran in the 29th Infantry Division, um, a man who would later become a doctor by the name of Harold Bumgarten, uh, suffered some of the most dreadful of wounds while fighting his way ashore on Omaha Beach. And uh, as a, a newspaper article later recounted his experiences, it said that shell fragments creased his skull and s mine shattered his knee and machine gun bullets smashed the small bones of his right foot. Uh, enemy rounds also tore away part of his face. Uh, you know, and this was a man who by all likelihood should not have survived his wounds, uh, but he did. He went through reconstructive surgeries he became a doctor. He dedicated his life to helping others just as others had helped him. And Harold Bumgarten, uh, seen here at the bottom, at old age, revisiting Omaha Beach, um, really became an eloquent spokesperson for his generation. And he, he spoke on behalf of many of those fellow veterans of the 29th who did not survive the Normandy invasion. <laughs> 
Um, all the while, um, we, we also circle back now to Martha Gellhorn of Collier's Weekly, uh, who was able to beat her husband, Ernest Hemingway, to the punch. Uh, she became the first female correspondent to step shore on Normandy, um, and she did so on the evening of June 6th itself. And she was absolutely emotionally overwhelmed by what she saw. Um, and she later wrote, it will be hard to tell you of the wounded. There were so many of them. There was no time to talk. There was just too much else to do. Uh, and so this is a prime example of a reporter putting down their pen for a, a brief moment and uh, helping the, the wounded, helping the, the unfolding situation that was all around them. Um, and of course, um, it, it was the nurses in many instances who were the unsung heroes of uh, cases like this. And as reporters said that these nurses and these doctors, they were toiling away like demons, just working around the clock, trying to save as many lives as possible. On the day following D-Day, uh, perhaps the best known correspondent of the war, Ernest Hemingway, or rather Ernie Pyle, excuse me, uh, walks ashore. And he too was overcome by what he saw. And uh, he said, on the beach lay expended sufficient men and mechanism for a small war. They were gone forever now, and yet we could afford it. And in what I think is one of the best reports of the Normandy invasion, um, Pyle describes all of this human litter of war, as he calls it, that was left on the beaches, personal items. There were shaving kits, there were rosary beads, uh, there were eyeglasses, there was a tennis racket, there was a guitar, there was a, a stray dog looking for its owner. There were journals and diaries with blank pages for, you know, representing lives that, that would go unfinished as a result of, of what he found here on, on the beachhead. And he just ultimately concluded that this was the horrible waste of war that was standing here in front of him. And he, like so many others, attempted to find purpose behind all of this death and destruction, answers which would ultimately become very, very evident as the war dragged on. Uh, the other element uh, of my book, the final third of my book, uh, looks at how citizens and soldiers and politicians and people from every walk of life on the home front responded to news of the Normandy invasion. And uh, here too, I found some, some very revealing and uh, emotional content. And, you know, at first when Americans were informed of the Normandy invasion, they didn't all know how to react. They thought, do, do we celebrate? Do we close down shop for the day? Do we work an extra shift at the factory? Do we go to church? Uh, and invariably, the answer was all of the above. Uh, but I, I think this photograph of a synagogue in New York City uh, very much sums it all up rather nicely. Um, it says that special services on D-Day will take place. All are welcome that there was this degree of unity, there was a strong sense of purpose, a collective notion of sacrifice, a belief in the greater good uh, that resonated as a result of D-Day. And uh, you see these very magnanimous gestures on large parts of the American public as a result. Uh, sadly, though, this did not mean that there was unity and togetherness in all aspects of American society. And unfortunately, this was sadly so in regard to the issues of, of race in American society. Um, in Cincinnati, Ohio, concurrent with D-Day, um, there was a very large labor strike at a Wright Aeronautical plant where thousands of workers had left their job because uh, six African-American workers had been hired to work alongside them in the metal shop. Um, and so the mere presence of African-Americans in the eyes of a lot of these white employees prompted a strike. And uh, rightfully so, the Cincinnati uh, Post uh, called out these workers 
And they, they said, you right workers, what will you say to the fathers and mothers of those men who fall in France? Um, and so there were demands for these, these differences to be put aside in the name of war mobilization to continue to take place. And so once again, uh, surprising to me is that issues of civil rights, civil rights movement that would blossom in the 1950s and the 1960s, uh, likewise has at least some of its roots connected with the Normandy invasion in 1944. Uh, I think one of the more poignant of stories that I found, uh, it takes place in the streets of Carentan, exactly two weeks after D-Day, um, when several members of the 101st Airborne were being uh, awarded and recognized for their heroics. And it wasn't merely this ceremony that caught my eye, but what immediately followed. Uh, because uh, after the ceremony, um, these paratroopers were treated to a showing of a romantic comedy, Andy Hardy's Blonde Trouble, in the nearby YMCA, which was called Le Jean d'Arc. And, you know, for 90 minutes, these paratroopers who had been fighting constantly over the past two weeks, they were able to enjoy each other's camaraderie. They had a good laugh. They were slapping each other on the back. They were kids again. For 90 minutes, they were able to escape the war and everything that it had done to them. It also, this moment also recognizes the fact that this town had been liberated. You know, no longer were the, the French people going to have to watch German films. They had their theater back. And so very symbolic here. And even more symbolic is the fact that for many of those paratroopers in, in attendance, this movie would be the last one that they would ever see. And indeed, it, it, it forecast the long road to Berlin that lay ahead. As we consider the long-term consequences of the, the Normandy invasion, there's perhaps few places in the United States that, that capture the, the drama and the emotion of D-Day than the National D-Day Memorial. And I'd like to just share a, a brief excerpt uh, of my book that, in my mind, explains why this is so. And I write, few sites in the United States evoke the seismic consequences of D-Day more than Bedford, Virginia. Nestled in the picturesque Blue Ridge Mountains, the community of 3,200 was like many small towns. Everybody knew their neighbors. Main Street was the hub of life. The local newspaper was a civic compass. Bedford's commonness vanished in a heartbeat when townspeople learned of the deaths of 22 of their sons in Normandy, reportedly the highest per capita invasion loss of any town in the nation. The Bedford Bulletin offered what consolation it could, stating that the boys died for a, quote, justice toward which mankind has been struggling since the dawn of time. The community thereafter became something of a lifeless shell. People didn't feel like going out and doing things for a good while, reflected resident Marie Powers. No dances, no picnics, no laughing. For years, the town was shrouded by a cloak of grief too painful to endure. It was such a sad time. It was terrible, said Powers. But people loved one another, and people supported each other. Much of that melancholy was released in 2001, when Bedford became the home of the impressive National D-Day Memorial. And I think one of, of course, the only few places that can compete with that emotional power is the, the Normandy American Cemetery itself on the bluffs overlooking Omaha Beach, where close to 9,400 American service members killed in this campaign rest in eternal repose. Uh, and so as we look at all of these tombstones, this accounts for only 2% of the total number of Americans lost in the Second World War, and an even lesser amount of the total 65 million estimated people to lose their lives globally in the Second World War. And Nearly 80 years later, 
we must ask ourselves this very important question, and that is, what do we owe the dead? What do we learn from all of this loss and all of this suffering? And I think Dwight Eisenhower said it best when just days after the invasion, he made a promise to the American people and also war reporters. And he said, our countries fight best when our people are best informed. I should feel disturbed if I thought that I or my public relations staff were held as anything but friends of the press. I will never tell you anything false. And so in Dwight Eisenhower's mind, this civic literacy, this openness, this transparency, this honesty, having a good relationship with the press, this was a primary means of honoring the fallen of the Second World War. And he continued to reflect on that throughout the remainder of his life, including in 1964, when Eisenhower returns to Normandy with CBS News journalist Walter Cronkite, who himself had been a war reporter during World War II. And as Eisenhower was overlooking those tombstones of the Normandy American Cemetery, he told Cronkite, I devoutly hope that we will never again have to see such scenes as these. I think and hope and pray that humanity will learn more than we had learned up to that time. But these people gave us a chance and they bought time for us so that we can do better than we have before. And the question that we must continue to ask nearly eight decades later is what are we going to do with that chance? that these men and women of the 1940s gave us. And that, in many ways, is the great task remaining all of these years later. That concludes my talk. I uh, welcome you to uh, check out some of my books that are currently out or will be forthcoming. Uh, this includes Dispatches of D-Day, the basis for my talk today, Hang Tough, which is a biography of Dick Winters of Band of Brothers fame, and uh, my forthcoming book that will be out later this year um, looks at another officer of Easy Company uh, from Band of Brothers, uh, and that is the mysterious and sometimes enigmatic paratrooper by the name of Ronald Spears. Uh, so I welcome you to uh, check out those books. And uh, what we can do right now is that we can open up the floor to some conversation and some questions. Well, thank you very much, Jared. That was fascinating. And uh, we appreciate your insight, all the research that you've done. Um, I'll start with my own question, if you don't mind. I live in Salem, Virginia, which is about half an hour from where we are here in Bedford. And the local paper there referred to D-Day as I-Day, presumably for invasion. And that's the only time I've ever seen a reference to D-Day not called D-Day. Uh, did you ever run across any other usages of the term? Uh, I have not. Uh, that, I've, I myself have never heard of I-Day. That's very, very interesting. Uh, but the other anecdote that I can uh, offer in that regard is that in the buildup to D-Day, thousands of people were writing questions to their local newspapers asking what that D actually meant in D-Day. And that's still, of course, a, a question that we get today. And uh, one of the common answers that we get is that D stood for de-embarkation. That, that's often what's in the history books or what historians tell us. Uh, but back in 1944, that, that's not what it meant at all. Um, and uh, the Secretary of War at the time uh, told the Associated Press that, that D actually meant nothing, that it, in essence, it meant day day. Um, and, and so it, it's a rather unglamorous, boring phrase, you know, that doesn't quite capture the, the drama of, of that day. Uh, but uh, that's sometimes how bureaucracy works. Excellent. And we get that question about the, uh, the, the term quite often here on tours as well. Uh, another question has come in. Did you get a sense from the local newspapers that you researched uh, that there was a growing anxiety and anticipation in 
communities across the United States that the invasion date must be getting near. Um, obviously, no one knew the date, but the longer the war goes, the more obvious D-Day's got to be soon. So uh, did you run across a great deal of uh, anxiety? Was it more excitement and eagerness to get the job done? Uh, it, it was, in essence, all of the above. Um, and you know, it, it varied from town to town and person to person, uh, featured in these newspaper accounts. But, you know, I, I would say the, the bottom line is that there was this prevailing sense of tension, uh, not only in regard to big picture matters, like, does this all have the potential to break down? <laughs> what will happen to the international community? If that fails, what does it mean for our alliance with with all of our you know allied countries? There was these big picture concerns, and then there were also individual concerns. What will happen to my boy? What will happen to my husband? What will happen to my spouse uh, who is overseas? Um, and so um, this sense of tension was palpable in newspaper accounts. And newspapers, by and large, were very much unlike the newspapers that we have today. Newspapers of the 1940s captured every little snippet of community life imaginable. I mean, uh, they would have little articles about people's birthday parties. They would list, you know, who was at the birthday party, you know, everything imaginable, stuff that newspapers would never do today. And that really allows for a wonderful perspective, a snapshot that we can gain of 1940s life. Uh, and, you know, in with the absence of, of social media, not having, you know, any other really means to communicate other than the written word, uh, this is how people express their opinions. People didn't have Twitter accounts. They, they couldn't talk about these things on in a digital venue as we can today. Um, and so this was the prevailing importance of newspapers for communities and citizens. Aspect of that, I think, is that no one knew what units were involved for weeks afterwards. So if you had a son you knew was stationed somewhere in England, was all he was able to tell you, uh, you didn't know if his you if his division hit the beach first or uh, you know came in later or at all. And that added, I think, to a lot of the anxiety. Um, another another question uh, that has come across our wire service um, about the African American press in the United States. In your research, did you come across any efforts to stifle or to criticize the African American press uh, as possibly hurting the war effort because they were uh, reporting on racial injustice and even racial violence? In some cases, this this was true um, in regard to how uh, certain power establishments tried to stifle uh, the freedom of the press in regard to African American newspapers and the civil rights movement. Um, because what a lot of African Americans were told during the war years um, is that. I'm paraphrasing here, but in essence, we need your support. We need your manual labor. Uh, we need your sons and daughters for service. And this whole civil rights issue is just going to have to wait. Um, and so, you know, in in some cases, you know, individuals were just told to put on the brakes. Uh, and that, you know, and, you know, if you look back through history, uh, suffragettes, who advocated enfranchisement during World War I were told the same thing. They were essentially told, shut up, do your part. Uh, this is an unhealthy distraction to winning the war. Um, and so invariably, civil rights advocates uh, were, they were tried to be you know, stifled as well in, in a similar way um, during World War II. But uh, these advocates weren't going anywhere. Uh, and they realized the contradictions at play, that you could not fight for a democratic, free way of life while denying people at home the, the right to vote and making them abide by segregation.
I mean, so the, these dynamics are very much at play in, uh, in 1940s rhetoric and editorial pieces. Uh, and uh, those, uh, that tension would, would only escalate in some regards in the years following. often uh, pointed out to my students that uh, it's not a coincidence that the main advances in civil rights in the United States come after World War II, uh, when African Americans came marching home in uniform and had those questions, uh, very you know, pertinent questions to ask about why we are facing discrimination after helping to win this uh, war against tyranny. Uh, so no, that's also a fascinating subject. Uh, another question, uh, do you know how many chaplains landed on American beaches or jumped in uh, behind the beaches on D-Day and what their casualty rate was? I don't have a specific number in regard to chaplains, um, in, in regard to the number that went ashore on D-Day and or the number that were killed. Uh, but in, in the days and weeks that followed, there were sometimes substantial numbers of chaplains who were involved in these firefights, uh, killed um, in some circumstances. And there's, um, there's been a lot of really great scholarship uh, done on all of this. Um, and the name of the book evades me at the moment, but there's a, a whole book about the history of chaplains um, during the Second World War that just does a really fantastic job. Um, in, in some cases, though, uh, there were uh, chaplain paratroopers and, uh, you know, and there were all sorts of, you know, wonderful names that the paratroopers gave them. You know, the, kind of the, the universal nickname for them was Holy Joes. Uh, but, you know, sometimes they were called Chappy, uh, which was uh, short for chaplain. And, uh, you know, it, there was this overwhelming sense of admiration uh, for a, a priest or a preacher or a minister who would also earn their jump wings. <laughs> and the, the prevailing joke was, is that uh, <laughs> uh, perhaps these, these chaplains uh, wanted to get a little bit too close to heaven. And that's why uh, they wanted to uh, become paratroopers as such. Uh, but, you know, it, uh, my, my hat's off to, you know, all those chaplains who, who did serve because much like the medics, um, it, it takes a lot of grit uh, to go into battle without a weapon. And much like the medics, they sometimes pay the ultimate price for doing so. This day uh, where, uh, and I forget the name of the chaplain in the movie, but he's, he's diving down to try to retrieve his communion set that had uh, sunk in, in uh, the water when he jumped. Um, and I think it was... Stephen Ambrose, who said uh, of all the thousands of veterans, when he when he interviewed them, if they ever said so and so was the bravest man I ever met, inevitably it was either a chaplain or a medic. And I can I can see his point. Uh, another another question came in a little on a on a personal note for you. you kind of answered this earlier, but uh, just to go into more detail. What other books and projects are you working on now? Tell us a little bit more about your upcoming one. Well, uh, with uh, with Fierce Valor, uh, the, the story of uh, Ronald Spears, uh, I, I spent, that was my one of my pandemic projects while I was uh, cooped up at, at home and uh, teaching classes online. Uh, but what that book will do, I, I think it'll, it'll, put to rest a lot of the, the myths, the misconceptions, and the stories about this uh, a fairly mysterious officer who was in Easy Company, the 506 Parachute Infantry Regiment. And for uh, fans of the series, um, I, I think they'll get a very rich perspective um, in, in this biography. You know, I went into the project um, with my co-author, Eric Dorr, not entirely sure what we were going to find. And uh, in the long run, we ended up writing a 100,000 word biography of this guy who we weren't sure if we would be able to write a biography at all. I um, mean, so I, I think it'll be very revealing. And uh, I think fans of the series will really enjoy that. Um, on, on my plate, besides that, um, I'm also currently working on my dissertation in American studies. 
And uh, with that topic, I am merging together uh, two of my primary research interests, and that's the, the Civil War and the Second World War. And what I'm researching in that regard is the World War II history of Gettysburg National Military Park. And uh, when I tell people that, I sometimes get a, a quizzical look, like, what's that all about? Um, but like many of our national parks during World War II, um, these places were centers of mobilization. They were training grounds. The military used our national parks during World War II. And at Gettysburg, uh, there were top secret, uh, you know, endeavors that were ongoing, such as uh, psychological warfare training. There were 800 German prisoners of war that lived on the fields of Pickett's Charge for the better part of two years. Uh, there were, you know, discussions and debates about, well, should we should we scrap and melt down the Civil War monuments to turn them into tanks and war materials? Um, and all the while, in addition to that, uh, Gettysburg and the Gettysburg Address held sublime symbolic significance for the American people during World War II. And so uh, my my forthcoming dissertation, which I hope will subsequently be a book, uh, looks at all of those issues. Uh, simply put, how was the Gettysburg battlefield physically and symbolically used in the 1940s and the World War II era? Um, so those are the things that I'm working on. And of course, a veteran by the name of Eisenhower settled in Gettysburg uh, for a while after the war. That will be part of it as well. Yeah, excellent. Uh, Lindsay, any other questions come in? Well, I believe that is all our questions. We're about out of time. So, Jared, I want to thank you. I don't think this will be the last time we hear from you. Uh, we look forward to your next visit down here to Bedford uh, and, uh, you know, maybe joining us again when, you're, when your next book comes out. Uh, so we'll look forward to that. And meantime, absolutely keep in touch. Uh, for all of you who've joined us on Facebook or YouTube or whatever platform, thank you for joining us. And uh, we look forward to Join in on our upcoming Lunchbox lectures. You can always check our webpage, dday.org, for uh, all our upcoming events, not just lectures, but also commemorations and special events. Uh, so uh, absolutely check into dday.org frequently. And uh, for now, we want to thank you again and turn you loose. Uh, again, from Bedford, I am John Long, the Director of Education here at the Memorial, and we thank you for joining us.